Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure. I really liked your, your talk yesterday and uh, I read some of your articles, so I think there's a lot of uh, potential for interdisciplinary debate, which is what we are interested in at SESH. So my uh, talk is going to, to address the issues I've been working on. Uh, and yeah, Islamophobia is a more recent concern, and you are racism. I've been working on this for over 10 years now. And I've studied specifically cases of school segregation, both of a school that was segregated for three years with only Roma pupils in Portugal, and later a form that was segregated within a school. So in this talk, I engage with key contemporary issues and debates regarding anti-Roma racism in Europe, and I want to pay particular attention to the issue of segregation in education. I attempt to make evident the role of public institutions in perpetuating and renovating racialized governmentalities through neoliberal logics and overcome the dominant culturalist approaches to this population that disconnect the symbolic and material aspects that inform anti-Roma racism and the racial capitalism and which you have so thoroughly analyzed. So recently we have seen unparalleled protest and mobilization in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis in May 2020. In the context of increased right-wing populism and extremism, as well as COVID-19 exacerbated inequalities, these black-led demonstrations received support for their efforts to denounce <coughs> institutionalized racism from other racialized populations across the world, and for instance, Aboriginal peoples in Australia, indigenous communities in Brazil. In Portugal, the participation of Roma activists was particularly noticeable in the demonstrations taking place in Lisbon or in Coimbra. This wave of global protests helped to refocus the debate on the role of the state and modern institutions in perpetuating racism in democratic contexts, grounded on a critique of the liberal and Eurocentric understanding of racism, which was consolidated with what Alan Alendian has called UNESCO tradition in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and it, this is a tradition that helped to reify certain notions which we will find familiar that continue to influence much political and academic debate nowadays. And I quote the earlier uh, UNESCO statements on race. Racism as residing in the minds of men as a matter of ignorance and prejudice, a social evil, and the denial of democratic principles. This approach to racism centered on biased attitudes of ignorant racist individuals as until today hinder its identification beyond exceptional and deliberate situations and disconnected racism from the historical processes and context of its emergence. The still dominant Eurocentric, positivist and liberal framework on racism has continued to favor the misrecognition of its institutionalized expressions alongside culturalist explanations of those subjected to racism and the Roma artists in point, and so the minoritized or racialized populations want to be scrutinized to determine whether X or Y event was really racist in an attempt to rationalize the minds and deeds of so-called racist subjects. So I'd like now to address the question of anti-Roma racism in Europe in general and going back to Portugal. In much of Europe, although increasingly subjected to critique, Roma populations have been relatively absent from policy making and academic scholarship, continuing to be subjected to culturalist explanations that elude the social political structures that shape Roma life trajectories and expectations. To overcome such presentist and exotifying understandings, we must consider the crucial role played by processes of racialization within nation formation and post colonial projects with which the history of the Roma is entangled. Most noticeably, a considerable amount of legislation was passed beginning in the 16th century aimed at the forced assimilation of the Roma. And this was the case in Portugal. Such legislation served to regulate the terms of Roma presence, exile from the metropolitan territory to the colonies, the Gredo, and even extermination, legal efforts which exposed the metropole periphery relationship. In Portugal, Adolf Coelho's work in 1892 was a significant scholar and giver, as he mapped the permits, laws, and ordinances produced by Portuguese authorities since the 1500s, illustrating the centuries-old persecution of the Roma people. In these legal frameworks, the Roma were constructed as socially defined and undesirable in the nation. 
The fate of those who rejected the simulation by giving up language, trust codes, and customs was often mandatory work in the galleys and exiled to the colonies of Angola, Cape Verde, and Brazil, freeing the metropole from irredeemable people. In metropolitan Portugal, rules and regulations aimed at controlling the presence of the Roma population in the national territory culminated in the criminalization of people just for being a gypsy, and this was manifested in the customs, language, and the time. Such processes began to take place across Europe in early modernity, with variations across the social political context. Lucas, for instance, analyzed state formation processes in England and Germany from the 16th century to the 20th. Specific specifically, he addressed the changing legal dispositions <coughs> towards the gypsies, and I quote, I quote, as reflecting the interaction between central and local levels of governance and differences in the political management of issues such as poor relief, vagrancy, population movement, and migrations. Shifting attitudes to the Roma could also be found in the church and secular authorities, as well as among local uh, populations, and were reflected in the arts, in theatre, literature, and so on. Significantly, alongside their criminalization, the Roma people became romanticized as noble savages in the national imaginaries. Kellner, for instance, highlights how in the British academic context of the 19th century, and I quote, the discourses of gypsyology were then linked to the colonial discourses of Orientalism as scholars search for congruences between the racial, linguistic, and cultural attributes of gypsies on the one hand and various populations of India on the other. Such ambivalence attests to the construction of the Roma population as a homogeneous group that, while lacking a stable definition, faced genocidal persecution across much of Europe. The Roma people are diverse in their geographical origins, traditions, and phenotypes. They do not fall into a neatly defined ethnic group, but they have been marked by different two processes of racialization. In the reification of the Roma population as an ethnic group, which is a culturalist tradition, uh, sorry, culturalist legacy of the UNESCO tradition, constitutes an important discursive device for legitimizing racism. This culturalization of politics evades any acknowledgement of how relations of power produced the Roma population as, and I quote a number of reports from the European Union in the early 2010, 2011, the most vulnerable to disadvantage and the most discriminated against in Europe. Moreover, the focus on the specificities <coughs> of Roma culture that could underlie situations of discrimination provide the framework in which racism is rationalized legitimated and naturalized, while this population is constantly reconstituted as culturally and ontologically different. There is ample research in different European contexts documenting historical, structural disadvantage and institutionalized racism against the Roma population in health, housing, education, imprisonment and employment. And in Portugal, such cases I'm going to gloss over, but just want to, to highlight Special segregation, forced uh, territorial mobilization, inequalities in access to social housing, uh, poor educational qualifications and professional training, compounded by high unemployment rates, overrepresentation in police detentions, court hearings and imprisonments, significant structural disadvantage in education, with only 2.8% rate of success in secondary schooling in 2014, and 0.1% the rate of success in university. Uh, when one studies from segregation, such a broad picture which Henny Covince yesterday so thoroughly analyzed cannot be lost of sight at the expense of turning the study of situations of segregation as a dead hand for the racist subject. Uh, and so I would like to bring now some reflections on school segregation. I mean, I cannot bring into any detail the specific cases that I've studied, but we can address those later. But I would like to, to bring some ideas that emerge from discourse analysis of official documents and imperial research, highlighting that this work was carried out between 2010 and 2020, and it focused <coughs> specifically on professionals with uh, decision-making uh, uh, capabilities. I would first highlight the difficulty of just naming seg segregation as such, and this was mentioned yesterday. But, I mean, even in European reports, for instance, you may have a report in Portugal talking about what is really segregation in education, but you just 
don't we use the word segregation, it's like an happenstance. It happens that there was a lot of Roma peoples. Whereas for instance, the same report by the ECRI in Italy uses the word segregation. So first, just you know, a quick note to highlight that it's difficult to use the vocabulary of segregation, which immediately draws on imaginaries of structural inequality, the possibility of intentionality or not, and so on. So first, I want to highlight situations of school segregation do not result from the isolated decisions of one racist individual. Rather, school segregation, which may be expressed in Roma only or a large concentration of Roma children in specific schools or academic trajectories or forms, is, and I quote Goldstein, a product of administrative, sorry, administrative practice, so multiple individual decisions of school administrators, <coughs> teachers, parents, and psychologists. In research on different cases of school segregation, participants most often try to help me find a racist subject who was responsible for the situation studied, anxiously try to look at blame on one specific individual rather than reflect on the existing institutional structures that allowed such cases to happen despite anti-discrimination legislation in democratic societies. The constitution of Roma only forms can in no way result from the actions of a single individual. By law, a school composes the students' forms, then the district director needs to approve it and send it to the Ministry of Education for validation. In the research I carried out on a segregated form of 14 Roma students, all managerial procedures were followed, but the situation persisted for a full school year. This is despite the situation being denounced by Roma families and activists, reaching national parliament and the Obundsman, being covered in local and national media, and debated by op opposition political parties, uh, all of whom fed it from view when the media turned to the next big thing. So, I mean, the idea is that, of course, this is a compound, uh, uh, a compound of different interests and decisions. Second, school segregation is often attendant on spatial exclusion and the phenomenon of white flight. And this has been documented on research, even my previous research on a school that functioned with only three, uh, uh, sorry, only seven to 14 students who were Roma for three full school years at a time of, in which, because of uh, uh, intervention by the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund, all small primary schools were being closed. This school had special permission to function because it was functioning only with Roma kids due to white flight. All the families in a tiny village, as one social worker made a joke, suddenly in a tiny village all non-Roma families found a job elsewhere and took their kids from the school, even going against the law at the time. The law changed me. So uh, school segregation is often resulting from special exclusion and white flight. Uh, this has been documented also by, by reports by uh, European bodies, which we have to say that they note the situations of discrimination, but these institutions were designed with no powers to enforce any action by member states, so the Fundamental Rights Agency or the European Commission Against Racism and Inequality. For instance, in 2011, FRA suggested that the fact of segregation in education may result from residential segregation and why parental strategies to avoid integrated education. The report claimed that about 30% of children in this group, they don't say it's white, but that's what they mean, so they are not immigrant or Roma, attended schools outside of their catchment area in Europe. In 2017, Fran noted that segregation in education remains a problem. The UMIDIS 2 survey results show that across Europe, Almost half of children aged 6 to 15 attend schools where all or most of the schoolmates are Roma. So where special segregation is not so obvious and ensures inter-school segregation, so sending Roma kids to other schools, not our, so to speak, intra-school segregation by way of, constitution, of constituting Roma-only forms has been deployed to ensure that Roma children are kept apart from their better off peers. So regarding Portugal, the European Commission has stated that it is aware that a small number of Roma-only classes have been established in certain municipalities. Sometimes such classes are located outside the school premises and the image of these containers that you also showed 
for special enrollment classes is also very illustrative. The most recent equity report on Portugal Sorry, Mark, that okay, stated that in 2016, mm. segregation at school was still substantial, with 11% of Roma children uh, schooled in classes of entirely Roma pupils in Portugal. So this is, this is telling. Third, school authorities may justify this, what they see isolated acts as technical and administrative issue that sometimes even retort to pedagogical <coughs> qualifications rather than uh, discuss it as a political decision. So official statements may include that uh, you know, discourses such as students have a similar level of learning, which is very low, they have no place in regular classes or no expectations for secondary education, as we did witness in Philbrook. But as one father asked, when Roma father asked, has not a single non-Roma child been categorized as having special educational needs? In a research interview, we were informed that academic <coughs> expectations had been lowered for the Roma class study, and the Roma students did not have access to the full curriculum. The issue with school segregation is not only that it places Roma students at an increased disadvantage, but also that it seems to be a strategy by some white families of ensuring their entitlement to what can be called as a Roma-free education, in fear they will lower the academic standards, social manners, and future expectations of their protected children. Some teachers may also benefit from such arrangements. In the last school study, we were told how some teachers more established in their careers felt entitled to teach white children only, a process with, which I have been hearing in my research since the mid-90s, actually. Quoting one retiring teacher, it is said that there is a lot of school dropout, dropout among Roma families, and this is a kind of official uh, uh, device to justify where you know we don't have uh, redistributive measures for, for Roma people. <coughs> so the problem is that when these children come to school, no one wants to teach them. So they send it to the less experienced teachers. Whilst in Portugal we are very proud to not set students by their cognitive ability, or not to have any strong school hierarchies, some hidden strategies of grouping people seem to function in a way that caters for the needs of the most privileged students, making state schools more appealing to middle class families. And fourth, segregation seems to result less from a well meant chain of institutional decisions than being a strategy to preserve the status quo enshrining ethno racial inequality. So in Portugal, research agendas have neglected the study of school choice in regards to race or racism, despite abundant anecdotal evidence of a relationship between them. In Lisbon, for instance, a former policymaker described the situation of de facto school segregation resulting from white flight as a ticking bomb. The constitution of segregated school forms is an invisible aspect of this process. In the research, several participants with professional responsibilities addressed the process of intra-school selection whereby the most experienced teachers were disproportionately allocated better school, school cohorts, which means those comprised by children from privileged families, which meant that greater public resources were attributed to those already in best socioeconomic positions. Racism permeated these process, processes often in a way that protected privileged white families from the effects, real or imagined, of integration. That these schools prioritize the racial concerns of white families, that their children will be educated alongside peers from cultural traditions they perceived as primitive or unfit for modern schooling, and this was heard in the research all the time. The non-Roma families view these other students as not quite Portuguese and distant to, not to notions of Europeanness and fear they would lower the standards of education. Following our field work at the school, the new district director drew, drew our attention to the unequal distribution of Roma students between the local school districts. So all our research were fo was focused on entangling the processes that allow justifying the segregation of these pupils in one single form. And when we're finishing the research, we understood well, we are discussing a school district, which in the city that we studied was actually the only school district that accepted Roma students. So the other they had the failed policy of not admitting them, we even saw a registry saying, this uh, student does not fit 
the characteristics of this school, and this was uh, uh, supposedly a current practice. So here, this quote illustrates just that. I'm not going to read the quotes because of lack of time. So segregated forms are not exceptional, but only the visible aspect of a system that regularly segregates, typically without public scrutiny or complaint. Hence, any attempt to tackle processes of segregation must not lose sight of the wider social political context, the relevant institutional structures, and the everyday practices at play in which whiteness is typically, typically protected. Over the past decades, the neoliberal education agenda, with its free school choice motto that enables privileged families to select the most successful schools outside the catchment area, has contributed to establishing a context in which school segregation goes unchallenged. In Portugal, as other European contexts, this agenda has not been reserved by mainstream political parties on the left. And as a representative of a European organization of, on Roma rights stated, and I will read this one, once free school choice is put, it can never be taken back. I mean, a liberal politician says they granted it. So it's not something, once that free school choice has begun, who's the politician who's going to take it away from the people? When it comes to white flight, every specific flight of white people is contextual. But again, as a general thing, that, there are steps that can be taken to mitigate it. In conclusion, the study of Roma school segregation documents how institutional racism is enacted through a series of classificatory practices and decisions within a wider neoliberal <coughs> education context. It is an example of discriminatory practices that perpetually render the Roma population vulnerable. Roma students are still struggling to access the full curriculum, being disproportionately allocated to special needs forms and alternative meaning technical educational trajectories, facing situations <coughs> of segregation and seeing their historical presence in the country practically obliterated from the curriculum. Considering school-to-work transitions, it's not surprising that this population suffers from a disproportionately high employment rate due to the structural patterns of social exclusion, which in turn legitimate unemployment on cultural factors and lack of educational uh, qualifications as a kind of full circle. So rather, this process is hinted how under racial capitalism, the state relies on the perpetual articulation of racial and educational difference to sustain the inequalities necessary for exploitation under capitalism. Despite the dismal picture presented, it's important to note the increasing leadership of Roma activists in education, highlighting the role of women. For instance, the Operation of Lay Initiative, Rise Up Roma Youth, resulting from a partnership between the Roma Association, Letras Nomades, and the Portuguese Platform for Women's Rights to provide scholarships to students in higher education, in which came to receive state sponsorship in 2016. The initiative benefiting dozens of Roma men and mostly women illustrate that Roma populations are building their political autonomy and wish to partake on equal terms in academic debate, knowledge production and policy making, hence exploring the fissures in racial capitalism to advance intersectional justice.